So Sue Michaelovitz, um, I met her, goodness, I guess it's been almost a year now when I first started working at the Camden Public Library. Um, Sue came in and um, our executive director introduced her to me and she was immediately like, what can I do? How can I help? Can I do a program? And I said, yes, what, what do you want to talk about? And she did a really interesting and helpful program last year about taking care of your hands and your arms. Um, and I later found out that not only is she a physical therapist, she's also a very brilliant photographer. And so I spoke to her about doing um, a, a show in our picker room at the library. And we had that set up for this year. And unfortunately, because of COVID-19, it couldn't happen. So I hope that we can get that rescheduled again for a physical, um, a physical exhibit of her photography soon uh, when it's safe to do so again. But luckily, Sue was willing to do this talk tonight. So we will get a chance to see some of her beautiful photographs and hear about her experiences in Guatemala. So Sue has, has quite an impressive um, bio and it's long and I think it's important because someone who works this hard deserves to be recognized for it. So bear with me while I read you her wonderful bio. Sue Michaelovitz is presently an MFA candidate at, Maine Media, at Media Arts at Maine Media College. Her work is in photography and book arts. Prior to entering the MFA program, she spent a 45 year career as a physical therapist, including teaching master's and doctoral students, delivering clinical care, and participating in research. She is an adjunct associate professor, Department of Rehabilitation and Regenerative Medicine program in physical therapy at Columbia University. Sue has served as a volunteer with Guatemala Healing Hands Foundation for medical and community outreach trips to Guatemala. And locally here in Camden, she has recently uh, joined the Education Committee at the Farnsworth Museum um, and is also on the Community Events Committee for the Camden Conference. So busy, busy lady. And I am so happy to welcome to this talk this evening, Sue Michaelovitz. Yay! Thank you very much. I'm going to go on screen share. Matt's clapping. Thanks, Matt. So first, I would like to acknowledge the Camden Public Library um, for having me back again. Thank you. And I wanted to first give a nod to the photo exhibit that wasn't yet. Ellen Toby, Toby Slotnick, a friend of mine and a photographer who also has recently relocated to Midcoast, Maine uh, from Boston. Uh, and I were going to do a dual show on my trips to Guatemala and her trips to Cuba. So when we're able to reschedule, we'll be doing that. And hopefully all of you, even if you're in another country, can come and visit. What I'd like to do tonight is talk about the experiences that I've had in Guatemala. I've participated in nine medical missions and outreach missions from 2007 to 2018 with Guatemala Healing Hands Foundation. The last trip they made was in 2019, but because of my school schedule, I was unable to go with them on that trip. I've learned to love the colors and the people of Guatemala. They're friendly, they're kind, and they're loving. They also live in different living circumstances than many of us. Those that live out in the country live usually in small towns and small family compounds. And this is one of the compounds pictured here. Guatemala is a beautiful country with beautiful people. There are 15 million people in the country and more than a million people in the capital of Guatemala City. The population of, um, of Guatemala are people who are Spanish of, of origin and Mayan of origin. There are challenges in Guatemala related to uh, government, safety, health, and nutrition. And that applies to the areas in Guatemala City 
and in the highlands and in some of the uh, northern areas that abut Mexico. So why choose Guatemala for medical missions and community outreach? And there are many opportunities and many options. I've been involved with the American Association for Hand Surgery for a couple of decades now. And they have an outreach program called the Vargas International Hand Therapy Teaching Award. And the therapist who's on the board at the time helps choose the location for a therapist to have a grant to go to an underserved area or a developing area to work with a hand surgeon and with people in the community. Uh, Lynn Bassini, who's an occupational therapist and hand therapist who presently lives in Brooklyn, uh, chose 2004 trip to be in Guatemala. And Sharon Desk Andruskowicz was the first recipient of that. The trip went very well. And then a couple of years later, Lynn um, developed a nonprofit organization called Guatemala Healing Hands Foundation. Lynn grew up in Guatemala, came to the United States to go to the University of Pennsylvania and stayed in the States to practice over a number of years in Brooklyn. Uh, GHHF is, a, uh, is dedicated to improving the quality and availability of healthcare in Guatemala through education, surgery, and therapy. We specialize in the treatment of congenital and hand injuries for the children and adults in Guatemala. So how does this all happen? I know a number of people have done outreach trips. A couple are, are on this call now. And there are different ways of doing trips. You can join an already existing group like I did with Guatemalan Healing Hands Foundation, develop a group like Lynn did, work with much larger organizations that stop in for emergency care like Doctors Without Borders or Partners in Health. Uh, when you go in to do a trip, you have to have a plan and a vision and understand the culture of the country or the city that you're visiting what can facilitate a good trip and what some of the barriers are. We also have to prioritize programs, but you can't, you can't do everything. A solid team has to be put together. One of the um, foundations of Guatemala Healing Hands is to be able to send a same or similar team over the years. So we develop relationships with people in the community and maintain those relationships. We have to collect resources, including money, and get donations of supplies implement the programs and then evaluate the programs and follow up. As volunteers, and there are usually between 40 and 50 of us that go on one of these trips, we pay all of our own expenses, but we still need money for surgeries, education and community outreach. So we all do fundraising through personal solicitation. Each volunteer is expected to raise funds. We also have done seminars and workshops in the cities in which we live. And in order to have a successful trip, we have to raise at least $120,000 for the trip. That is um, in addition to the donations of medical supplies, clothing and hygiene supplies. And many of you, thank you, who are on the call tonight have been donors. Our team for Guatemala Healing Hands Foundation includes surgeons that are hand surgeons, either from the background as an orthopedic surgeon or a plastic surgeon, hand therapists, who are occupational therapists or physical therapists, operating room nurses and technicians, anesthesiologists and lay person volunteers. And you can see our t-shirt from the Dream Team from 2016, that was uh, two trips ago for me, and the listing of all the names of the people who come on the trip. We have uh, volunteers that primarily come from the United States, but there are also uh, surgeons and nurses and therapists who come from Canada, and one of our surgeons is from um, Spain. Many people also have the opportunity to participate in this with their families. Uh, the person pictured on the top left, Karen Levis, is a um, hand surgeon at McMaster University, and this is her daughter, Sydney, who's come with her on the trips. My husband, Paul, has joined me on two of the trips so far. Hugo Suarez, who is one of our guides in Guatemala and his wife Mirza have been very active in uh, including their family on the trips. And Lynn Bassini has developed a wonderful relationship as I have with Marta Beatriz Pinata Molina, who's on the call tonight, and her son Chino, who have assisted with us on our trips. Our drivers are our guides and our friends. Hugo has a staff 
who works with us to safely transport us around Guatemala. You can imagine there are a lot of moving pieces when you have multidisciplinary healthcare providers and lay people who go to more than one, loca one location in one day. The, the people who have been driving with us have been with us for years. We also find new family in unexpected places on our journeys. One of our hand surgeons was uh, with his um, son and their college soccer team in Guatemala and they met Oscar. Oscar was busking in a town off Lake Atilan and Oscar came, ended up joining our mission that year and for a couple of other times. And unfortunately, Oscar lost both his hands and part of his arms when he was in a bus accident that his father was killed in when he was about seven years old. He'd been a great help to me and a couple of the missions to help me pack supplies and organize things. What you're seeing now is him holding his certificate from graduating fifth grade. He was funded uh, by Guatemala Healing Hands to go back to and attend school so he could help with his family. He was one of the primary uh, um, income generators in his family. So what, what does a typical trip look like? What's our agenda with Guatemala Healing Hands Foundation? We have to get there. When we get there, we team build because some people haven't met each other on the trip or haven't worked together that much. We participate in seminars and ongoing education. There's a screening day, surgery days, therapy days, and a social community outreach project that we've been involved in since 2010. So getting there with supplies and people isn't always so easy. Uh, about 20 or 30 of the volunteers fly out of New York City with boxes of supplies that are donated, medical supplies, medications, and um, donations for people in the communities that we serve. And they fly together and then have to enter into Guatemala City. We have had some trouble coming in through customs. One year when I flew down with Lynn from New York City, it took her an hour and a half to get through customs because they started unpacking all the boxes, including some of the sterilized packs for surgery. And after she resolved that, we were on our merry way. Because we work in small quarters and we have a very busy schedule, we oftentimes spend a couple of days getting to know each other before we begin the seminars and medical care. We do our team building in, Guata in Antigua, which is about 45 minutes outside Guatemala City. It's a beautiful old Spanish town. For those of you who would like to study Spanish, there are many schools there where you can immerse to learn Spanish. So we get to know each other and learn about part of the culture. And that's only an introduction to the culture. It's taken me many trips to appreciate the extent of the culture in Guatemala. Uh, one of the main public transportation uh, systems in Guatemala are chicken buses, which are repainted, reused old school buses that aren't necessarily that safe. There are many shop owners and small shops and, and markets throughout Guatemala. And kids trying to make money on their own. This boy um, was trying to sell some goat milk. We do team building activities like zip lining and visiting coffee plantations and visiting a macadamia nut farm. Then after two days in Antigua, we move on to Guatemala City where the primary focus of our medical care is done. We have a conference, patient care, and professional education as part of that. There's a one-day bilingual conference that now has presenters from both the United States, Guatemala, Canada, and Spain. And the participants are therapists, therapy students, surgeons, and medical students from all over Guatemala. We typically have gotten between 140 and 450 people to come to our one-day uh, seminar where we do lectures and workshops. We have translators for our seminars and workshops. On the left is um, Dr. Carolyn uh, Monero, who um, I'd like her to be my doctor. She's a veterinarian. She's a, but she also has been working as a medical translator for a number of years uh, with um, an associated company. After the seminar day, uh, we go up and, and visit a village in uh, the highlands of Guatemala, a village that we work with. And I'll come back to that village during the second part of my talk. We 
uh, have a, a full day screening day for children. And they come from all over Guatemala to see us into Guatemala City. There is a lot of coordination to recruit kids to see us and to have their families be able to come into the city to be able to stay in the city for screening and then potential surgery or therapy. So the, their uh, purposes of the screening day, um, first of all, uh, we try to determine who's a surgical candidate, who's a therapy candidate, and who may be neither at the time. And the reason why I have an asterisk up by screening day and text on the bottom is our surgeons only operate on kids as part of our medical mission. They do no surgeries on adults. The therapists work with adults in other locations, though, in addition to the surgical hospital. Screening day is a 10 to 12 hour day. We screen 130 to 180 kids. And some, as I had said, travel hours to see us. On my very first trip in 2007, we were in um, a facility that had a very, very narrow waiting room and everybody was told to come at 7.30, by 7.30 in the morning. And we arrived a little bit after that and we had to walk through this very narrow room past uh, everybody that was sitting there and waiting for hope for their children. And it took me about three nanoseconds before I started crying. It was like, it was very overwhelming to see that families were entrusting us with their children and with the potential future of their children in that moment. We see a number of different diagnoses that, um, that affect children. Um, one of the primary diagnoses are congenital differences or birth defects where a child may be born with fingers that are fused together or extra thumbs or extra digits or limbs that are partly missing or deformed. There are a number of electrical burn injuries in Guatemala and thermal burn injuries from uh, the open flame stoves that are used in many of the homes. There are birth injuries that affect the nerves that go into the arm, gunshot wounds, machete injuries, spinal cord injuries, cerebral palsy, and uncommon syndromes like Apert syndrome. The surgeons all sit together in screening day and one child comes in at a time with one to five family members or one to two family members. Uh, here are two of our surgeons evaluating kids on, um, on screening day. We work in tight, warm quarters during that time. Yeah, the therapists during screening day do assessments to see if um, any of the kids are candidates for therapy and or surgery. And sometimes um, a, a small therapy session is given during that screening day. Uh, the therapist that's pictured there, Becky Naduski, is from uh, Ilan University. She's the Dean of Health Professions there. And she started going to Guatemala on the second trip and has been there many times and taken a lot of her students with her. We also document all the kids and their hand and arm problems. My job that day is to photograph all the kids' hands and arms and put them in order with their x-rays to provide them to the surgeons when they go into the operating room so they can plan ahead of time prior to going into the OR because they see so many kids in one day, 130 to 150, they sometimes need a refresher as to who's coming into the OR when. So part of screening day is decision making. And what you're seeing here is the high technology way that decisions are made regarding surgery. After the kids are seen, the operating room schedule is developed and there are three operating rooms. You can see that by three columns on the board. And one day is worked on at a time and the surgeons are split up based on their expertise and the extent of um, surgery that is needed, how many hours are needed in the operating room. So there may be cases that just take a half hour, but there may be cases that take hours. So they have to have a good rotation and the right surgeon in the right room. Then the surgeons perform surgeries over five days. They begin their days very early in the morning and may operate until five to nine o'clock at night. Um, during the time period, that we're in Guatemala, they do approximately 50 to 60 surgeries. And there's a team of 10 surgeons. 
that have been coming with us uh, for a number of years. Once in a while, there's a new surgeon that joins in or another one that can't come because of family or work responsibilities. There are three anesthesiologists uh, or, or two anesthesiologists and, and a nurse an anesthetist to come with us and operating and recovery room nurses. So you can see it's a very big team that works with us. Miguel Perella Cruz was the first surgeon that went with Lynn to the trip to Guatemala in 2004 and has been a regular and a very big contributor to our team. He is from uh, Texas and New Mexico. I want to give a shout out to the work our surgeons do in the operating room. Um, oftentimes they have the opportunity to work together with their colleagues from different parts of the country when in fact they don't have that opportunity to do that in the United States. And um, they pair up together and, and teach each other as they go along. We also love our operating room nurses and recovery room nurses. They're a very strong addition to the team and the work couldn't be done without them. The day, each morning after surgeries, some of the team goes into the OR and some of the team goes around on post-operative rounds. In the hospital that we use, which is a small stucco compound owned by the Shalom Foundation based out of Tennessee, there are spaces for about 12 kids to stay overnight and they may stay anywhere from one to three nights. And then there are also um, areas for the therapist to work and there are three small operating rooms that run at the same time. Uh, in the middle is, is a Dr. Jay Telsani, he's a surgeon from Allentown, who um, I used to work with at Temple University. And he's been a regular coming on the trip and also contributes other things to the trip other than surgery, which I'll show you. Alex McKenzie is a therapist next to him, and she was the head of staff at Hospital for Special Surgery for a number of years and has been also regular on the trip. Care following surgery uh, may involve uh, visits with therapists where we may fabricate splints for the kids to go home in or fabricate an approximation of a splint that the child may then have put on after their bandages and cast come off. There is a physician as part of the Shalom Foundation who does do follow up with us and sometimes the kids are also referred to therapy in their area. It's really important to have good follow-up care, um, uh, particularly because of some of the nutritional and healing challenges of, of the kids in Guatemala. The therapists, in addition to working in the hospital, also go out into the community to assess and treat children and adults uh, throughout Guatemala. And I don't think I can link on to this. This is a little video. Oh, yes, I can. Let me see. We go to a number of community hospitals in Guatemala City. There's one of them that I went to every trip I was on except for one, Hospital Roosevelt, that's a city hospital. And I work with the occupational therapists and, and physical therapists in first teaching them how to fabricate splints and also in helping them learn to assess patients. And something that is really changed in the culture over the years that we've been going there is the way we interact with therapists in the clinic. In the very beginning, the therapists are very shy and we would do the teaching and they would listen and sometimes they would ask questions and sometimes they wouldn't. Then we got to the point where they were comfortable with asking questions about why we're doing this and why we're doing that, or can you show us this or that? And now when the return trips are made, most of the time the therapists bring in patients who they've been working with, present the case, discuss what they're doing, discuss why, and then we have a dialogue back and forth about what they've been doing. We've also learned quite a bit from the therapists in Guatemala. One of the therapists, OT, is, is I would say one of the world's experts in burn care. She's an occupational therapist and works at the burn hospital where we have the opportunity to go 
and learn from OT. Uh, pictured on the right is Aviva Wolf, uh, who is an occupational therapist, also a former head of therapy at Hospital for Special Surgery. And she came with us on the uh, Vargas Award one year to Guatemala. We also teach seminars and workshops in the hotel in which we stay and also in uh, community hospitals and in the universities. On my first or second trip there, I think it was the second trip, I started a teaching program with the university. And we've been able to do that up until the last two trips, where we go in and teach university students who are in their entry level curriculum, mostly in physical therapy. There are far more physical therapists in Guatemala than there are occupational therapists. So this is Aviva teaching um, a group of therapists. We prefer to have a small number of therapists come to the workshops so we can give uh, some more individual attention to them. So the format is typically a lecture about anatomy or an evaluation, and then we work with them on how to perform different skills. And this is also the opportunity for those who are shy to ask us questions rather than in a very big teaching situation. Now, before we move on to community outreach, uh, which is um, a pretty exciting part of our trip as the rest of it is, I'd like to know if I'm going to go off uh, share screen for a minute. And I'd like to know if there are people here who have questions or comments and if there are people who have been on medical missions. I know Steve Karp is here. He's been to Guatemala. Um, is it okay to unmute people now? Uh, can you unmute? People? Yes. So what I'll do, normally we just keep everyone muted just so that we don't have a lot of background noise, yes, yes, but I'm yes. going to go ahead and I'm going to make it so people can unmute themselves. So they should be able to unmute themselves now if anyone has a question for, for Sue. Uh, Sue? Uh -huh. Hi, Matt. This is Matt. Hi. Uh, I wondered if you, when you were down there, if you got any sense of the violence and the uh, gang culture that seems to threaten so many Guatemalans that they head north. I was made very aware of it. And yes, I have had a sense of it. I can give you a couple of examples. Um, the people who uh, take us around Guatemala are all armed um, wherever we go um, because there is a, a huge drug cartel problem coming through Central America and, and does affect Guatemala uh, intensely. Um, we also have, um, the first time I was on the trip, I had the chance during our, uh, during the trip to hike um, Pacaya, which is one of the volcanoes. And I rode up with uh, to Pacaya, which is about two hours out of Guatemala City with Hugo Suarez. And I was in, in the car with him and, and, we, and it was really foggy when we got to the base of, um, of the uh, volcano and Ugo got a machete out. He had his, packed his gun on one side, his machete on the other side. And I said, Ugo, we're going up to the volcano. Are you gonna bushwhack the way up? And he said, no, we take these for additional protection with us. Huh. I also have seen a number of uh, uh, patients in Guatemala City who had machete injuries anywhere from a cut on their arm to losing part of the arm from machete injury. Um, there, uh, there are um, people who I've seen, Marta took me to uh, one of her patients' houses with her uh, on one of the visits when I was there, and he was a, a businessman who had been shot in the neck and, and became uh, quadriplegic as a result of that. Uh, uh, Marta is on, and Steve is on, is also uh, from Guatemala. You may wish to do, um, to add into this if you have anything to say. Everybody's on mute right now. Yeah. No. Sue, I, I have a question. This is Cindy Beams. Okay. Do you, are all the Cindy, surgeries Cindy, you do? Just give me one, one second. Of course. Uh, Steve or Marta, do you have anything to add about the sense of um, problems in Guatemala? Yeah. Hi, Sue. It's so nice to see you again. It's been a while. Uh, we practice in the southeastern corner of Guatemala near Honduras, and it's really a rural area. So there's not as much danger down there. But Sue's exactly right that if you go to a supermarket, uh, there'll be a security guard with a automatic rifle at the door, which is a little bit frightening the first time you see it. Um, the police are just not very effective in Guatemala, so there's a lot of private militias. 
in our clinical practice, as with Sue, we see a number of traumatic injuries due to machete, due to uh, bullets, due to knifing uh, within the local population, uh, much more than we see here in the United States. Thank you. So Steve, you first started going there when you were teaching at Temple University, and now you're at DeSalis University. Do you still continue from that university? Yes, uh, we'll be going down for our eighth visit this February, hopefully. Any other comments that people want to add on before I address Cindy's question? Okay, Cindy. Hi, um, I, I was interested to know, are, are the surgeries you do mostly with hands and limbs or it could be any kind of surgery? I wasn't quite clear about that. Okay, the, the surgeries that we do on this trip are only hands, um, hands up to the neck. Okay. If, if somebody brings in a child who may have a facial deformity, right. in addition to a hand problem, then there's information that's given to them through the Shalom Foundation to be able to make a connection to another group of surgeons who may be coming. I see, okay, thank you. There are also other areas of the body are used. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, there was uh, one of the uh, patients who had a really bad burn injury on their arm and had a really contracted elbow. They couldn't straighten their elbow out and, and it was very deforming and very debilitating. And what happened was um, during this time period, just during this time period, um, the person didn't have enough skin that was loose enough to straighten the elbow out. So a very large piece was taken from the back. It's called a latissimus dorsi flap. And that was flapped around and helped to reconstruct the person's arm. So while the surgery is all related to the arm, other body areas are oftentimes used as donor sites. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so Ashley, can I talk? Ash oh, sure, Marcus. I, Marcus, I, I, don't know if you, I don't know if you can see me. Um, are you on, do you have your video Marcus. link on or off, Marta? Oh, my, my video for me is okay, but I don't know if you, you no, I can't see you. can't see you. But I have a picture of you later, so don't worry. <laughs> okay, no, I just want to point something about the security in Guatemala now because we have been in three months of uh, lockdown here in Guatemala and we are reopening very slow, very slowly, some of the business since um, the middle of May. But I think uh, the security in Guatemala now is better but just because everybody is locked down from 6 uh, p.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning, and all the weekends we have to be at home, and only the people who is working in hospitals, as uh, as we do, we we are able to to go out. So this is uh, some of the good changes in Guatemala because of the of the virus. You know, just that. Hmm. Thank you, Marta. Now Ashley Bush writes that she's uh, never been on a medical mission, but she lives in Antigua, Guatemala, which is one of my favorite places ever. I hope you really love it there as, as you do it. I always feel very safe in Antigua. I really do. Oh yes, I Antigua is very, is very safe. It's very yeah. safe all the time. I would love to chime in. Hi, Sue. This is Ashley. Can you see me? Yes, absolutely. Yes, so I'm, I moved here to Antigua with my husband last December, and uh, so we had three months of an intensely amount of wonderful fun, and then we had this, of course, global pandemic, but I'd like to echo what Marta said. Um, it does feel safe to me here. Antigua is a little bit of a bubble in the country. I'm aware of that. And it's changed a lot since the lockdown in mid-March, but happily um, there's a big police presence here and it does feel very safe and lovely and we're still very happy to be here. Okay, so okay. you're going to have to meet Hugo Suarez. I will give you his contact later. I thought he might be on tonight, but he's not. Uh, yeah, I'd like he to. Lives in he lives in Antigua. He's one of the coolest people on the planet. Awesome. <laughs> Any other questions or comments before I go into the next part? It looks like Kendall has her hand raised. Kendall, you're muted, Kendall. 
It's hard to mute you. Okay. Okay. You are muted. Yeah. Isn't that, yeah. How do you unmute me? Um, You're unmuted. <laughs> Couple questions. Um, first, um, and you may get into this later, but I'd like to know some um, resources as far as how we can contribute more to the organization, um, outreach from an uh, individual standpoint, or what we could do through our workplace, and um, also collaboration on your end. Like you had mentioned, that if someone had a facial deformity due to whatever, that you all team up with other organizations and how do y'all, how do you do that? Um, it's done through um, contacts that Lynn has already made in Guatemala. Contacts uh -huh. is the surgeons who were there may have. Uh, there are also surgeons that we've worked with in, in Guatemala. Unfortunately, one of the prime surgeons that we worked with for years, Gustavo Lopez, uh, passed away last year. Uh -huh. But there are other surgeons that we collaborate with. Okay. And we, uh, so there are resources and organizations that are all interconnected with each other. Uh, there, as far as donating and as supplies, there, uh, the best thing to do is connect with Guatemala Healing Hands Foundation to directly do that. Okay. And, and that, that link can be found in the, um, in the chat box right Mo now. Uh, Mona Lipson or um, Lynn Bassini will be happy to help you with that. Thank you. I'm going to go on share screen on my end now and go back to where my slides were. And if everyone could just take a moment to please mute themselves during the second portion of the program. I probably shouldn't do that, right? Not you. <laughs> I just have to get this out. I have to get my little thing out of the way so I can view my slides again. I'm sorry, I'm in a new program for me of PowerPoint, so I'm gonna to have to click through to go to where I want to be. It's not as facile when I'm sharing screen as what I'm accustomed to, so. You got to see everybody again. In 2010, there was a program begun uh, with Guatemala Healing Hands Foundation and Borjas Partners for Development. Uh, it was orchestrated by Lynn Bassini and Hugo Suarez. And the belief is that education is power. And Lynn wanted to go beyond, Lynn Bassini wanted to go beyond just working with the surgeons and therapists in Guatemala City and go into other communities in Guatemala and work on community development. So we began a community and social outreach program in Chichoy Alto Padzun, Guatemala. It's a community of about 2,000 people in the highlands southwest or uh, direct, uh, southwest of Guatemala City. There are programs that we've instituted for sanitation, nutrition, and education. I'll talk about each of those. In order to get to Chichoy Alto, it's quite a long drive on windy roads. It's about a two and a half hour drive on a good day in uh, vans over bumpy roads. And um, uh, Chichoy Alto is in the department of Chimaltenango. And Guatemala is divided up into departments. Guatemala City is in the department of Guatemala and Chichoy Alto, which is outside Patsoon, is in the um, uh, department of Chimaltenango. It's a community up in the highlands at about 8,000 feet. And it was a very um, underdeveloped community when we first started going. And we've done a lot of work to help, um, help the people in the community. So in between our seminar day and our screening day, the whole team, including surgeons and therapists and, and nurses, uh, pack into vans and ride into the town of, of Chichoy. And one of the really cool things we do when we're riding down into the um, town on the right-hand side, you can see we're sitting on top of Ugo's vans. And when we get there, we're greeted by the entire community who has spent the night before preparing foods that we have donated for probably the healthiest and largest meal the community has all year. Typically, the food they may have um, for lunchtime would be 
a boiled egg and tomato and water. And there is a lot of nutritional deficiency and health problems related to nutrition throughout uh, Guatemala. And we've been trying to work on improving that with this community. So when, when we come into the community, the kids oftentimes have parades for us. There's a music teacher that comes in and, and has started to teach the kids how to play different instruments. Instruments have been donated to the school. And, and the community walks us in and greets us as we get off the vans. That's another time that we cry when we get there. There's a bit of a cry festival while we're in Guatemala. They also put on a program for us. The school kids put on a program which begins with the marching in uh, of the Guatemala flag and the Guatemala anthem. And those of you who are familiar with the Guatemala anthem know that it is one of the longest uh, anthems anywhere in the world. The kids also put on uh, uh, performances and dances that relate to the culture and the entire community comes and watches. Now there is a bit of a dichotomy that you can notice if you look over her, her right shoulder. These are kids who didn't have the opportunity to go to school past elementary school, but everybody has a cell phone there, or almost everybody. It's very inexpensive to have a cell phone and to use that technology to communicate. And a number of the homes in the village have electricity, all of them do not go. We hold hands with the kids, march around, dance, have a big festival for the day. This is a part of the community uh, looking at the festival and, and uh, after they've had their very good meal that the women in the community have prepared. In addition to uh, having the festival, part of that day is also to fit everybody in the community with shoes or as many as we can with shoes. J tells, Dr. J. Talsani, who's pictured in the middle, is from Allentown, Pennsylvania. And he has helped to orchestrate the shoe collection and the donation. He typically brings down three to 400 pairs of shoes a year that he collects throughout the year in his orthopedic office in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And then a number of the other volunteers bring shoes. Many of the older women in the community have never worn shoes. You can tell by looking at their feet with the calluses and some of the toe deformities that they have. The kids line up for their shoes and they're, they're often as much more patient than a line of 200 kids in the United States would be or Canada would be. And they really are very proud of the shoes that, that they get. We also have been working on improving hygiene. And, and when I first started going there, there were no latrines or no toilets in the community. And people would have to relieve themselves out in the fields. There was a program along with the organization we originally worked with to build, I believe, 50 latrines in the community. And our lay volunteers go up during the week um, from Guatemala City to help work in Chichoy for a day to um, build latrines. We've also built and installed safe stoves. The stoves that were within the, the small homes that the people live in, and this is a home pictured um, right behind our volunteers. Um, they typically had uh, cooked on an open flame stove that filled the whole room with smoke. And it also was an area where people would have burn injuries, kids would fall into hot pots. And there's been a lot of education and retooling of the stove system that they've had. In addition to building latrines for each family compound in the community. Because education is a key component to improving anybody's life and a key to progressing uh, a community in, uh, in job possibilities and also prolonging life by better health, uh, we participated in building a school, a larger school in Chichoy. There was, there was a one-story small room that kids could go to elementary school in, but there's no possibility for education after that. So uh, it took about a year or so, maybe a year and a half, to build a second story to that building. And in many communities, um, the, the central locus of a community may be a church. Uh, in in Chichoy, the central locus now is the school. 
with the big area to play in front of the school. Uh, one year our volunteers participated in, um, in building desks for the schools because the, you can build a school but you need supplies for the school and the kids really had no place to do their work other than sitting on the floor prior to, being, uh, the, to the desks being built. And off, uh, off to the right hand side of the slide are two volunteers who are, are very good at carpentry. One is Dr. Jeff Greenberg, who's an orthopedic surgeon, hand surgeon, who asked to go to, up to Detroit one, at least one day while we're there. And Mike Zambos, who uh, has been with his wife and daughter on a trip, who uh, also contributes to uh, the layperson part of the trip. We began sponsoring students to leave the community to go to high school. And in high school, in, in, uh, in up in the community, they begin high school and go for three years. And during that three-year time period, they're educated for a trade or educated to then continue on to college. And my husband, Paul, and I have sponsored two of the kids so far for school. Uh, the first one we sponsored was Carlos, Olcott Olcott. And you can see uh, Carlos with the um, blue hat on his head. He went to school for three years to become an electrician. And part of his project during that time was to rewire his house. When the first time I went to his house and his house is right behind his uh, left shoulder, there were wires hanging out from everywhere and nothing was grounded and, and it, it was sort of a, a fire waiting to happen. And Carlos lives in this compound that has uh, two different living buildings with his mother, who is the older, shorter woman, and his father, who's wearing the straw hat behind him, brothers and sisters and cousins. So he went away uh, to go to school every day and then came back. And for two years, after he finished school, he left his community to work as an electrician in Guatemala. We, we communicate, we've been communicating ever since I met him. He wanted to come to the States to be an electrician. I told him he had to learn English first before he did that, because he'd have to do more schooling when he came to the States. He calls me godmother. Uh, for Carlos's high school graduation, uh, we went to the celebration and we bought him a toolbox with uh, tools that actually had rubber handles instead of metal faced handles, so it would be safer for him to do his work. He also saved everything that he had taken out of the house and worked on, and that's a pile that you're seeing on the lower left. We have a program of food and nutrition, and part of that program is providing water filters for their water, planting avocado trees to improve their nutrition, and buying chickens so they could have eggs and then also have the chickens to eat for meat. Um, unfortunately, at the beginning of COVID, um, all the chickens had to be sacrificed. And they're repopulating the area now with chickens when they can. But it's difficult to get up into the community because public transportation in that area has been stopped. And the government has regulations on how often somebody can come into the area. Uh, we, we try to help these kids uh, in promoting a healthy community. and. And you can see some of the kids playing after school. Kids are kids everywhere. They love to scream, they love to run, they love to play and have fun. And these kids are particularly affectionate and huggy. And some of them like to show off for a little, a little bit. And this guy is showing his attitude after he and his band have played for us. Chichoy during the pandemic, has uh, curfews, as Marta has expressed, and limited transportation because there has been some COVID in Chimaltenanga, but none in Chichoy Alto, Patsun, and they want to try to prevent transmission of that. We started, uh, Guatemala Healing Hands Foundation started an ongoing lunch program for the kids when they were in school and tried to continue that while the kids were out of school during the pandemic. And there have been deliveries made once a month of maize and other supplies for people to feed their animals and also feed themselves. And pictured on the left is Rosie Brooke Yoss, who has been working as our liaison in the community for a number of years. And she's the one that arranges, gets the permission from the government and arranges the transportation of the food into uh, the city, into the community. 
We have to keep records of what we do when we're there, uh, records of the surgeries, therapy, seminars, and community development. And we try to measure our outcome and how successful we believe we have been in the program. Uh, Marta at, uh, may be able to address the changes that she's seen in therapy in Guatemala since we've been there. I'll, I'll bring that up during the question and answer period. Guatemala is now a member of the International Federation for so Societies of Hand Therapy. There are eight member, 80 member countries around the world. Our version the United States is the American Society of Hand Therapists. This is Marta pictured in the middle between Lynn and her son Chino. Uh, Marta is a physical therapist and has her master's in respiratory therapy. Very few therapists in Guatemala have gone to graduate school. She's one of a handful that has done that. She has a private practice in, uh, in Guatemala City and also uh, privilege, privileges to treat patients in hospitals. She's a go-getter, she doesn't stop. Uh, she's the founder of Guatemala Hand Therapy Society and was the person instrumental in getting Guatemala into the Federation. So back to my title. We have uh, developed lifelong friendships and collaborations. We have built a, uh, a village of volunteers and friends to work within the communities that we serve. I'd like to go off stop share. And for the time we have left, see if there are further questions or comments. Marta, um, while I'm looking at questions or comments, can you do me a favor and come off mute? Can someone let Marta off mute? And tell us the changes that you have seen um, in Guatemala. Well, I think uh, the changes since um, Guatemala Healing Hands Foundation is coming to Guatemala are huge. Professionally and in the education of uh, physical therapists in Guatemala. PTs and OTs too. This, uh, I'm so sorry, my dog starts barking now. But um, as, as uh, you know, Sue is very, very busy all the time when she is going to some place. She always starts with uh, plans and programs. So she started a program to educate uh, physical therapists in Guatemala. We started with a very small a number of uh, people and every, the first time everything was um, in, a, in the same day. But now we have uh, programs, we have a big seminar, we have a, 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 how can I tell you this, this uh, small, the classes, the master classes in the community of uh, physical therapists. We visit all the um, hospitals in Guatemala, public hospitals, where they receive all the education from the uh, US um, therapist. So I think the, the changes in education in Guatemala has been very, very uh, big. Um, I had a chance. I had a chance to go to the American Society of Physical Therapists, uh, to the American Society of Hand Therapists, to express how the therapy in Guatemala has uh, changed. And I had a chance last year to go to Berlin, uh, to the International Federation of Societies of the Hand, to explain how Guatemala has changed uh, too. And part of the, this big change is uh, that now I am trying to express myself in English and I think I, I have improved that very, very much. And I hope you understand the very importance of these kind of missions because it's, uh, it's sad to say that these missions are, very, I are doing the best work than the government because you can see how the, a community has developed uh, where no one has come before. And if the, if the community has these kind of years, this is five or seven years of work, and it changed that lot, 
if the if our governments uh, could work better than they are doing, we we could we could change Guatemala in in a huge manner. So I think uh, I hope you understand you understood everything. <laughs> Absolutely, and and it, in parallel with Marta learning English, I tried to learn Spanish, and every time I tell Lynn I'm going to learn Spanish, she just laughs at me because I just can't learn another language. So your English is impeccable, Marta. Uh, oh, very much, um, and I. I, we are very thankful for uh, with you for everything you have done. Mm -hmm. We are thankful too. I have a lifelong friend in Guatemala, many lifelong friends. So uh, it, it's funny as I look at these questions, I can tell people's perspectives of, of where they're from, whether they are a former journalist, a newspaper editor, Matt, or um, uh, um, other uh, journalists or humanitarians. Maybe has a question. What's the hardest thing you found in this work? Uh, the hardest thing uh, for many of us has been what I call hurry up and wait. Because many of us in our practices are used to moving very fast. We're used to having the supplies that we want. And we're used to having easy access, even though medical care in the United States and Canada has changed quite a bit over the years and, and become a little less comfortable for many of us. When we're ready to do something and we have to wait for a long time, that can be a challenge. But it also helps to go back to the same place over and over again to build community. Many times when we go to conferences, people say, hey, I think I'll do Guatemala next year. Well, maybe you won't, because number one, there's a waiting list for people to get into the program, but also uh, Lynn, Lynn really wants people to come in who are gonna be committed to coming to Guatemala more than one time to help develop community. And I, and I hope my presentation tonight has shown you that we spend time uh, building community. Uh, a question that Martha has is how many hand surgeons and therapists are there in Guatemala? Uh, okay. Martha, you better to answer that because she's the head of the society. Yeah, we, we are divided in two uh, kinds. We have uh, technicians in physical therapy and professionals. Uh, professional. professional physical therapists are about 500. Um, and Marta, how many of those are hand therapists? 20 some maybe? No, uh, 20, 25, 25, 27. I can't remember exactly. 27, we are 27. But we are improving that, that number because the young people is, uh, is, uh, is joining everything and we have been working on that. Uh, sadly, we have to stop now because of the... Um, because of this uh, illness, There's, but um, as technicians are 900, Thank between 100 and 1,000. How about how many hand surgeons? I've only met about five, but they're more than that. Well, hand surgeons in the society, there are 14. 14. Mm -hmm. So that's to service a country of um, millions of people, right? Is uh, it we are now um, 18 million mm -hmm. this is, uh, since the last uh, uh, census in November, the last uh, year, we are 18. Uh -huh. And living in Guatemala City is uh, a million and a half. So it's, a, it's very crowded. Any other questions or comments? I, I think I'm scrolling. Uh, Nancy Wynn uh, said that you founded Guatemala Housing Alliance to work in the Highlands. I'd love to talk to you about that sometime. Do you live here? I live in Stonington. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's here compared to where Marta lives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, we, we started our organization in, uh, we became a nonprofit in 2011. And we do construction, we, we do Bajareque, which uh, uh, the wattle and daub, which I saw in some of your photos. Um, uh, we do that kind of construction, but then it's stuccoed over, so you can't tell. But we've moved more into education now, and um, we have 65 scholarship kids, including 15 that are in college, and um, three of them are going to become nurses. So I really do want to follow through with you. Um, to I'd see love what to talk to you. Yes, yeah. so, um, one, one, uh, one girl, because she was a girl when she started, woman now, uh, went to nursing school from Choi. 
Uh, and I believe that was the only one so far. Yeah. Um, any other questions or comments? We, we have a physical therapist from Chichoy now. Um, she ended her studies. It's Belsi Cocti. And she was um, inspired by all of you. So Martha also wants to know what other groups are going to Guatemala to treat people, what kinds of diseases. There's another hand surgery group that used to go to the Highlands. Um, there are uh, surgeons that go for dental work, for eye work. Um, yes, mm. plastic, plastic surgery for yeah. deformities of in the just face, mm -hmm. uh -huh. or um, uh, foot, working in, uh, in knee and uh, hip replacements too. We have a mission for that here in Guatemala City. But I, I, I know there are a lot of missions coming to Antigua and they are working in, in the hospital of uh, Hermano Pedro, but I don't, I don't know everybody who is coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, Tanya I made a comment that she's met kids with Apert syndrome in Toronto and it's great to learn that among the children you see. Uh, Tanya, it seems that uh, the diagnoses come in groups in Guana and on our trip. There was one trip we called the trip of the elbows. And I was fortunate that uh, Mark Barrett, who heads the hand surgery division at the University of Pittsburgh, who's an elbow specialist, was with us on that trip. But one year we had the year of Apert syndrome. And Apert syndrome is, is a, a syndrome that has some uh, facial characteristics and, and is associated with problems with swallowing and breathing and with a mild mental retardation. And one year we had, uh, I, last time I was there, there was a young girl who had Apert syndrome and her mother did too. And I, it's the first time I've seen a mother-daughter combination with Apert syndrome. I'm sure it's not the only mother-daughter combination of that. And did it affect both of their hands? Yes, and, uh, they typically have fingers that are fused, which is called syndactyly. And that's why they come to us for treatment to have their fingers separated. And one of the issues with these uh, kids when you do surgery is intubating them for general surgery because of the difficulty they have with their throat sometimes, their breathing. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I know, oh, Betty had a question about, uh, are we required to give uh, Guatemala our records? The, the records are kept in, in triplicate. The parents get one, the hospital gets one, Guatemala Healing Hands keeps one. They have to keep the records. The records that the government has to keep, though, are the are professional licenses prior to coming into Guatemala. And sometimes, we every time we go, we have to have approval from the government. Two trips ago, it wasn't until three days before we took off that the surgeons got permission to come to Guatemala. We have a colleague, uh, Warren Schubert, who's a surgeon in Minnesota. And one time his group went to go up to the Highlands, they got to the airport and they wouldn't let them in. So it, it, it's also important when you have a group like this to have a good legal staff in Guatemala City and Lynn has those connections since she is a native Guatemalan. Thank you very much for coming tonight, everybody. I went a little past the time. That's quite so, okay, Sue. It was, it was an extremely, extremely interesting and informative program, thank and thank you so much for doing it. Um, and again, if any of you want to share this program with someone you know who may enjoy well, it and who may get something out of it, yeah. we will be posting it on um, Camden Public Library Program's YouTube page. And all of you all around, and I'm so excited to have people from other countries joining us today, you're all welcome to join us anytime for a free program. Um, you can find all of the great programs we have at librarycamden.org. Hi, Paul. Thank you. I want Paul, Paul to come and say hi, hi to Marta and Martha. Hi, everybody, and Tanya. Thank you. Thanks for Thank coming. Thank you very okay. much. All right. Everyone have a great rest of your night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Thank Sue. Thanks for coming, everybody. Bye. Hugs and kisses, and to you, too, Marta. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, you. Sue.